Daryl, um, welcome to this webinar. I'd like to start this session today. Um, my name is Eve Silver from Wetlands International European Association. As some of you have also followed our webinars before the holidays, uh, which I would like to welcome back. And to our new participants, welcome to um, our talk on uh, re restoring river continuity. Um, some practicalities for this session. Um, this session will be recorded and will be uploaded to the Wetlands International uh, YouTube channel afterwards. Uh, you can find the link later on our website, europe.wetlands.org. Um, this session will have a presentation uh, for about one hour, after which we will give uh, some time for questions and answers. And I would like to ask everyone who would like to pose question to type it in the chat function, um, which you see in the panel on the right. Uh, and then I will collect the questions and our speaker will be able to answer them. Um, the session will close at the maximum of an hour and a half after this. I would like to give the floor to uh, Bruno Bott from uh, the Italian Center for River Restoration, who will introduce our speaker today. Uh, thank you, F, and uh, welcome to everybody. Um, our association, the Italian Center for River Restoration, um, is uh, uh, happy to have organized this uh, cycle of uh, webinar uh, together with uh, Wenta Wetland International Europe. And uh, we are dealing about uh, uh, a, a particular, a specific uh, part of uh, river uh, restoration, which is uh, uh, restoring river continuity methods and the open challenges. Uh, the, the webinar of today uh, is, is very important uh, uh, concerning uh, river continuity because we are talking, uh, we, we, have, we are going to talk about uh, uh, monitoring and evaluating uh, uh, fish connectivity, uh, which methods and uh, which uh, experiences. Um, Jan Abdallah is our speaker uh, for, for this webinar. Uh, he works uh, for a, a private company, Shimabio, uh, mainly in France, in the Rhone, Mediterranean and Corsican, uh, Corsica basins. And um, uh, he is uh, an expert uh, on monitoring uh, the effect uh, of, uh, for example, fish passes uh, and uh, on methods uh, such as uh, telemetry, genetic markers, and video um, counting system to, to demonstrate uh, and uh, to understand uh, if a fish passes uh, uh, works as, as uh, expected in general when we, we plan and realize this kind of uh, intervention. So, Jan, uh, the, the floor is, uh, is yours, and, uh, and thank you for accepting this uh, uh, to, to be the speaker for today okay thank you thank you too so yes my name is Jan Abdallah and uh, so I work for uh, a private company in France so CIMA Bio Interface and we are actually specialized on uh, uh, management and evaluation about aquatic environments and especially we work since a uh, few years now on fish connectivity. So today I will try to uh, present to you uh, different novel methods and also different experiences that we had in France, in rivers, lakes, uh, to monitor and evaluate fish connectivity. So to start the, my presentation, just a few words uh, about habitat fragmentation in general, because it, it has been recognized for 30 years now uh, as one of the five major factors of uh, biodiversity loss, along with pollution, overexploitation of natural reserves, invasive species, and climate change. And it's uh, especially the case for uh, aquatic environments and for fish. And so when we talk and when we work on uh, habitat fragmentation in rivers, 
we work on uh, yeah really important parts of the the dynamic population of fishes. And before to to talk about methods and tools, uh, I would like to say a few words about why uh, are fish moving. Um, so any species of fish uh, you consider, uh, they are constantly moving to accomplish their various uh, vital function in the river or in, in their environment. So this is, for example, to ensure their survival, so to escape to predators, uh, also because of competitors for the same habitat, for example, or uh, about environmental constraints, so like pollution or like floods. The second point is uh, move to reproduce. This is particularly important for sustainability of uh, species. So fish move in the river to find good habitat for the reproduction, but also to find uh, the good congeners. And the last point is uh, fish move to eat uh, because it means growth and also sexual maturity. Don't, so this is really important for the, the dynamic population. So movements needs uh, really change during the life history of the, the fish. And we see four different stages like larva, fry, juvenile, adult, and needs will be moved during this different stage. We will see after. The variability of uh, move needs also uh, varying at different uh, time scales. So you can have move during the same days, but you can also have move during a, an annual cycle of life. So you can understand that there's many, this is very different move, but also at a uh, scales of varying distance. So for example, for fry or juvenile, we talk about a few centimeters only, but when we talk about anadromous, this is about thousand kilometers. So here, for example, you have a, a hill. Hill will migrate uh, through the ocean. So this is a thousand of kilometers. And the last variability uh, in this space. So it's it explained in three dimension. So the the first one is longitudinally. For example, for anadromous, so they move upstream, downstream. But we have also the movements, the lateral movements, so from the main channel to tributaries or to hydraulic annexes. So this is particularly important for species like pike to find a habitat reproduction. And the last dimension is the vertical one, uh, in the case, for example, of lakes and large rivers. OK, um, we also identify two uh, big type of uh, two big categories of movement. This is the active one and the passive one. The active one uh, require energy consumption for the fish and a passive one uh, that consists of transport by the, 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 the moving environment. And we can distinguish like this different categories of movement in fish. So you have the big first category, passive moves. And there is inside of this category what we call transport, drift, and dispersion. Though, for example, forced transport downstream of part of the population. Uh, so it can move by during floods, for example, but also by drift. 
So the, this is always also passive moves between the spawning emergence zone to the, 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 the growth habitat. So this is especially for larvae and fry. And all these passive moves are really important for uh, the dynamic population. We talk later about gen flows, but yeah, for example, uh, forced transports during uh, floods uh, generates uh, gen flow uh, in inside of uh, a population. So this is really important move. And at the opposite, we consider active moves. So the first category of uh, active move is the periodic movements. So at the, the scale of uh, the, the, the day. So here you have the trout and the river. And we distinguish different uh, type of uh, area uh, used during the same days. So here, for example, you have in the, the, the blue area is the, the rest area. So in a big pool, for example, and close to this uh, area, you have another area we call activity area. So in, in red, and there are movements during the day between these two areas. So depend of river that you consider, but uh, you can have only a few meters between these two areas, but in some other river, uh, it can be a dozen meters or 100 meters. But in any case, uh, they are uh, characterized by very different habitats. In inside active moves, we also distinguish um, ontogenetic movements. So you remember the five stage. Uh, and during life, their ecological, physiological, and biological requir requirements uh, evolve a lot. Uh, there is also evolution of nutritional needs and dietary behavior. And that's why we, uh, we see habitat change during the, the life of the fish. And regularly, we find a relation between the height of water column and the size of the fish inside of the, the, the same species. So juvenile state is shallow water, and adults is like high water. This is a, a simple relation, but it's uh, often true in the field. And the last big category is migrations. So this is a really important one. And we can read this definition from uh, North Scott. Um, movements, so migration, it, 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 it's movements between two functional habitats occurring regularly during the life of the individual and affecting a large part of the population. So that's the big difference with, with all the, the other type of active movements. And we have different uh, parameters were specialized of migration. The first one is distances, because we always talk about a uh, big distance. So it can be dozen kilometers, but it can be 100 or 1,000 kilometers. Uh, it's generally gregarious mass movement. We all have in mind that this picture of uh, Sokai Salmon in, in river, for example, uh, in British Columbia, where you can see hundreds, thousands of uh, red salmon moving upstream of the river. So it's really a, a mass movement. And it's also a seasonal movement. So it not happen all during the, the, the year. For example, shad, the upstream migration, uh, it's, it's about 40 days during all year. So it's, it's quite short during the, 
during the year. And migration is also a real challenge for fish because we talk for semilparous. So semilparous, this is a fish who have only one reproduction in their life. They have a single reproduction migration. So they have to be successful to contribute to the dynamic population. So the, the migration is really an uh, important part of the, the life cycle of this uh, fish. For Eteroparus, uh, so um, uh, different reproduction during their life, it's uh, a bit different because for each migration of reproduction, you have a double trajectories. Upstream migration to find the habitat of reproduction and downstream migration to uh, go back to, to the sea. So uh, as you can see, there is many different type of movements, but what is important to, uh, to remind is that uh, all fishes, all fish need to move in the river. Okay, uh, now let's go to talk about uh, this connectivity in this continuity. So in part, we have the movement needs and in the other part, we have uh, that we can see here on this two picture. Uh, so the, the picture in the left, this is a recent inventory of dams realized in France. And each red point correspond to a dam. So there is many, many of them everywhere in the river. And yeah, we have more than 70,000 dams identified in France, so it's, it's, uh, it's huge. And we can understand uh, why for people it's so complicated to move inside rivers. But we also have problem with uh, recalibrated rivers. Uh, see this picture in the, the right side. I call this picture the, the Strangled River. You can easily understand why. Uh, this is the Drome, Drome River in, uh, in the Alps. And you can see how, how dikes uh, redux the, the active bed of this river. And it's also a big problem for lateral continuity for, uh, for fish. So quickly, what the results of uh, all this uh, 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 all these uh, dams and uh, dikes in the river. Uh, this is that we have many vulnerable species or even in danger of extinction or even extinct, like the, the Euro European sturgeon in the Rhone Basin. But all the, the fish that you have here have, uh, are in danger or vulnerable like uh, salmon, eels, uh, shad, lampreys, flounder, or other small local species like uh, Apron du Rhône, this small species here. So they are not vulnerable or in danger only because of fish continuity, but it's regularly one of the big aim to manage if we want to, to uh, to save this uh, species. Okay, I, I won't be longer about this. Uh, what the solution uh, to manage this problem? Uh, there is two big solutions. So dam or dike removal, and when it's not possible, uh, fish passage. So you heard already a lot about uh, these different solutions. So I, I, I won't be long uh, on this part, but what is really important to understand about it is that in 
all case, this uh, intervention, this action, require the acquisition of knowledge, whether before at the diagnostic stage or after uh, at the evaluation stage. So we, it's important to, to work on fish connectivity and to evaluate fish connectivity for different points. Uh, I think the first one is to check the level of achievements objective when we, we, we engage a project or an action. The other point, really important too, is to uh, generate data and uh, knowledge to inform and sensitive local actors, elected officials and public about our results. It's also to contribute to advancing art because it's, a, it's quite a recent art and we need uh, many backgrounds to, to contribute to, uh, to, 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 to advance in this art. And the last point is to generate objective uh, knowledge to guide policy and uh, decision making. So yeah, we easily understand uh, why it's important to, to get to these different points. But for that, we need uh, concrete data and concrete elements measurable in situ. And it's important to talk about in situ because this is really uh, data from the field uh, that is important. Uh, results that you will have in a river won't be the same that in another one. So it's important the, the, to, to measure in situ your, uh, your action or your project. So to, to get this knowledge and this data, we have uh, different tools uh, to, to work and to help us. We have actually many of them. Uh, we can say fisheries, trapping, <coughs> observation, underwater video counting systems, active telemetry, like radio or acoustic, passive telemetry, and genetic markers. So uh, because it, it, it takes too long to talk about all these tools, uh, I made a focus on three of them. So on the underwater video counting system, passive telemetry, and genetic marker. But if you have any question about the other one, we can talk uh, after, if you want. Before to, to uh, present tool per tool, uh, what is important to uh, think when you go to a project of uh, evaluation of fish continuity is to, uh, uh, to take all these, uh, all these elements to choose the good tool for the good information. And you need to care about time and spatial scale, about the, the species you work on, which biological stage, which stage of your project, what your budget, uh, what your technical skills, and which type and of environments and of dam you work on. So it's important to care about all these parameters to take the good decision and to, to use the good tool for the good information. And also, I would like to remember a few good truths uh, about evaluation of fish connectivity. And firstly, you have to know that 
the greater the migratory determinism, the more the dam is impossible, and the easier is it to highlight the biological gains. So, in other words, uh, if you work on Atlantic salmon and a big dam, really impossible, it will be quite easy to prove the to highlight the biological gains. But when you work on local species and on small dams, it can be much more difficult to highlight the biological gain. And it's important to know when you uh, build your projects. A few uh, different points important to build uh, good projects. Uh, the first one is the importance of having a robust initial assessment. This is really important if you want to compare the before and after uh, situation. And really often we, we think after the action, but it's also really important to, uh, to build the initial assessment. Also, two points. Choose the right spatial scale. Yes, you can work on the, the watershed, on the subbasin, on the river, or just on, on the dam scale. Also, choose the <coughs> right biological scale. Do you want to work on the species, just on population, or maybe just on individual scale? And the last point is, in any case, favor multi approach uh, to uh, take care of defragmentation effect of uh, natural variation of population and also on hydroclimatic extreme. So regularly, I, as I say that a good project, it's three years. Yeah. Uh, three years it's the good the good scale the good period one year is really dangerous and you can you can have problems so the best is three year is a good compromise okay so now we can go to the tools so the first one i can talk to you is the video counting system so actually we have two kind of uh, of uh, apparatus the first one is the lateral underground viewing room uh, so it's um really old we, we use it in in france and in europe for about 20 years now so it's it's quite well known and uh it's it, it, um so it's a window, a lateral window uh, inside a, a fish way. And at the opposite side of the window, you have a camera and a computer. And you, you just record the, the, the fish passage on video. And after that, you have to identify which species is it. So it's a semi-automatic uh, system. But this is a really interesting tool for quantitative approach because when you work on a impassable dam and you have all the fish who pass through the, 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 the fish pass, you can know all the, 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 the fish who migrate to your river. So for monitoring is a really important thing. So that's why in France we have a good uh, um, uh, 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 good installation. We have many installations in each big uh, rivers, uh, and we have uh, yeah re reliable uh, tool proven by 20 years of use. So it's uh, quite interesting. This is also good for communication and sensibilization because you you have uh, image of the fish, so it's good to communicate with, like on a website or on a 
uh, Facebook page, for example. But you also have to know that uh, there is a few limits. The first one is the turbidity. Uh, so that's why we have to, to build some uh, special passage for the fish because above uh, 60 centimeters wide, it's difficult to have a good image when, when you have floods. So turbidity can be a, a problem. The other one with uh, this system is the hydraulic constraints and civil engineering because you need to build a, a chamber close to the, the, the fish pass to install the, the camera and the, the computer. So it costs for the installation and it's also generally quite a lot of maintenance to uh, to 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 uh, to maintenance the, the windows and the, the backlighting. So that's why I think it's reserved for strong issue and big big fish way. But we have also a new kind of system. That's what I call removable system. So this is uh, uh, smaller and easier to adapt to existing uh, fishway. And in this panel, you have light and camera directly. And you can uh, install it in different place of the fishway. As you can see in this uh, different picture, so you can see at the exit of the fish pass, for example, or just above a slot on a pool uh, pool passes. So yeah, it's quite interesting and uh, it's open new possibility to to do video counting system. So that's the kind of uh, image that you can uh, produce. So you see it's quite interesting for, for communication, but also for data on fish, because you can watch the, the pattern of the fish, the, the external physical condition. So you get more information about your uh, fish with these images. So here you have a short video, but I don't think it's really smooth. No, it, it takes a lot of time to, to cheer. Yeah, so this is a salmon and a trout who cross the, the video counting system. So this is a yeah, really good tool to manage the migration uh, flows. Okay. So now the second one is the passive telemetry system. So that's what I call RFID for uh, radio frequency identification. And I think it's today the, the best tool for controlling the efficiency of uh, fish passage. Uh, before to present the tool, I just would like to stop a few minutes on uh, efficiency because uh, uh, it's important to talk to the same thing. So efficiency is the number of individual of species that manage to cross the fishway versus the number of individual who try to cross it. So I give you this little uh, example. So here you have a river, a dam, a fish passage, and a theoretical population that we tagged with, uh, with the RFID system. So this is a population of 12 fish. On these 12 fish, you have only 10 who move upstream. On this 10 fish, there is only eight who find the entrance 
of the fish way. And this report to the from eight to ten, this is the attractivity of your fish way. So here is eighty percent. And you have only six fish will enter inside of the fishway. That's what we call the accessibility. So here, this is six on eight, so 75%. And only four fish will come out. That's what we call passability. And this is here four to six, so 67%. And if we look in global, you have four fish who come out to the fishway for 10 fish moving upstream to them. So your fishway efficiency here is 40%. So the efficiency of a fishway is attractivity plus accessibility plus passability. And it's really important to understand these three different characteristics to describe fishway efficiency. OK, uh, so now we're going to present the technology. So it takes time to share the slide. OK. So this is a, um, a passive technology, look at the opposite of active uh, telemetry, just because there is no uh, battery used in the in the tag. And uh, uh, the tag that you can see here on the on the slide uh, respond to an electromagnetic field. This is the, the antenna. And when it is close to this electromagnetic field, it gives an alphanumeric code, a unique one. So that's why we can do uh, individual uh, study. The interesting thing with this uh, tag and this technology is that because we don't have battery, transponder lifetime equal lifetime of the fish. So you can uh, do study for a long time. And it's quite uh, interesting. In opposite to active telemetry or where you have battery inside of tags and the, the, the tag lifetime are uh, quite short. Uh, it's for example, a few months or maximum two or three years. Here, we are not limited in time. Also, is the, the tag is weakly invasive. We use uh, 12, 23, and 32 millimeters tag. So this is quite small. And it allows to mark fish from uh, 5 centimeters. So we can tag and we can study almost all species and all size of fish. The other good point is that uh, the, the, the cost of the tag, this is very accessible. This is between two and three euros per transponder. So it allows to mark a lot of fish. And it's really important, you will see after, uh, to, to, to tag a lot of fish. And the last point is that is quite simple and rapid to to tag the fish. So I have a short video here. Maybe it won't be too smooth. This is the problem. But doesn't matter. You can see, uh, so we take the, the fish who's anesthetized. And after with the a scalpel, we just cut one or two millimeter of the fish and we put the tag inside the peritoneal cavity and after that we just uh, record the number of the tag 
and released the fish. So in few seconds, you have tagged the fish and released in the river. So it's very weakly invasive. The diffusion of the electromagnetic field is uh, realized with uh, antennas. So they can be fixed or portable. And the really good thing with this technology is that we have a uh, high possibility to adaptation to the site. Um, at the opposite, because we don't have battery, our tag have a, a, a small detection distance. Uh, it's from 10 centimeter to one meter. Uh, with active tag, like a radio telemetry or acoustic telemetry, it's more uh, a few hundred meters of detection. So here, yeah, it's really close to the fish. But you need to design your uh, antenna to be close to your fish. That's the, that's the point. And the detection distance, depending on transponder size, so I told you there is three different size. Also from the antennas, so the thickness, the, the laying technique, and the environment, especially about conductivity. So when the fish pass uh, close to the, the antenna, the, it delivered an uh, alphanumeric code was recorded on data logger. And this is what you see in this uh, in the picture over here. So data are record in situ, but there is possibility to remote transfer with a GSM modem. And like this, you can get your data directly into your office or into your uh, smartphone. So this is very practical. So let's see now a few uh, antenna design. So here you see antenna design uh, for uh, fish passes. So you have different type of fish passes. And so we adapt the antenna design to the, to the fish passage design. So we can adapt very, very different type of, uh, of fish passage. It's also possible to uh, uh, to build antenna for rivers. So here we you have in the picture what we call pass through antennas. Uh, so it go cross to the river and the pa and the fish pass through the the antenna, or you have pass over antenna that we call also flatbed antenna. So, uh, yes, okay. In this picture, in the first plan, you have here the antenna to detect the fish. Another example here. Okay, it's, it's a bit long to chair. Okay, and here, a last uh, example. Okay, so in the second plan, you have the dam who we will evaluate. And at the first plan, we have here the antenna, the flatbed antenna. And the data logger are uh, in the bank. And the last uh, type of antenna is mobile antenna. So we have the data logger in the backpack and we can design uh, like circular antenna. So, so it looks like electronic fishing and you go upstream of the river and you detect directly the fish. And generally we synchronize the data logger with a GPS and like this, uh, when you detect a fish, you know 
the his position in the river so when you do different uh, mobile tracking uh, during the year you can uh, describe the the movement of the fish in the river like this so it's mostly for small rivers but it can also use for big rivers if there is not too much uh, level of water the, the the limit of the method is not really the the wide of the river but it's the the depth of water column here you have the uh, mobile antenna for a river in uh, North America. This river is about 80 meters large, but very shallow, so it's possible to, to do it. Okay, for the, the technology presentation, and now a uh, concrete uh, example of use. And I will talk about the evaluation of the possibility of the uh, Soduman fish pass on the Drac River. So this is in, in the French Alps. This is a pools fish pass with uh, 15 pools. And we have, that you can see on the, on the picture, four slots per pool. So two upstream and two downstream. And uh, the species were trout, sculpin, and barbel. Uh, mostly. Okay, now let's go to the, the RFID system design. Uh, it's long to chair. Okay, so we have a system with uh, eight antennas actually we have four antenna at fish pass in trance so this is the the green point and we have four antenna at fish pass exits the the the, the blue point and also what we call marker tag this is the test tag to check the the probability of detection of our fish so this design offer a really fine reading of behaviors and also the possibility to evaluate the prob probability of detection. But you have to know that we generate a lot of data because we tagged uh, more than 600 fish and with eight antenna, it, it generate many, many, many data. So you have to be uh good to manage all this data it's important so after the antenna system we did electric fishing to tag uh, the fish so like you seen before on the on the video so here we put the tag in the peritoneal cavity and you can see the healing on trout and on the barbel uh, just a few weeks after tagging and you can see there is really good healing just a few weeks after so it's really good result good good observation so we have almost a hundred percent of tag retention with this uh, system so as i told you we tagged 634 fish, mostly trout and barbel. And it's interesting to, to note that we tagged uh, 24 of fish uh, below 10 centimeter. So we, we had a really good effort on small size. It is also important to, to evaluate fish connectivity for little uh size and uh, results of this study <coughs> so we evaluated the fish tag behavior pattern with the group of two antenna 
So you have four levels of two antenna, and each group of antenna is a possibility level. And we distinguish five different groups. The first one correspond to fish tagged, but never detected in the fish pass. So this is the, the most of the, 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 the fish tag, 75% of, uh, of trout and 55% uh, of barbell. And potential behavior pattern is non-migrants, dead, or did not find the fish pass entrance. We, we can not uh, discriminate before this free potential behavior. But yeah, mostly this is non-migrants and did not find the fish pass entrance. We have the group number two, who correspond to fish detected in the fish pass, but without exceeding the level number two. So it correspond to non-migrants, uh, characterized with exploratory movements just before the entrance uh, of the of the fish pass. Group three, fish detected in the fish pass, but without exceeding level number three. So it's close to the group number two. Uh, it can be non-migrant fish, but it can be also migrants having failed to cross the fish pass. And it's exactly the same for the group number four. So group number four, this is fish detected at level four, but stay in the fish pass. So it can be fish stuck upstream for behavioral or physical reasons, like jams in the in the exit of the of the fish pass. And the last group correspond to fish having crossed the fish pass. So this is migrant fish, and it correspond to 15% of uh, trout and about 30% of, uh, of barber. So this description is really interesting because it allows us to uh, understand really precisely how the, the, the fish use the fish pass and where we can have problem to manage in our fish way system. What's the global reports? Firstly, you see the importance to tag a lot of fish. Because when you work on residence fish, even like trout and barbel, the most of the population will not move during your study. So that's why you need to, to tag a lot of fish. <coughs> and also because we've seen that we have many different behaviors inside of the same population. So if you tag only 10 fish, you will only describe singular pattern, uh, behavior pattern. So you need to, to tag a lot of fish. The interesting point where to all the tag species were detected in the fish pass, but with very variable determinism. Barbell, 56%, sculpin, almost 100%. But when they entrance into the fish pass, we have significant passability and with very short crossing time. And also all size, all size class were, were represented. So it was pretty good result for our fish way. So this is it for RFID. And now I finish my presentation with the genetic markers. So genetic markers, we have uh, two objectives. The first one is to characterize the genetic structuring of population on a micro geographic scale. And the other point is to evaluate gene flow between population in relation to presence of dams. Genetic is 
a well-adapted tool for identifying isolated and connected population to monitor the effect of restoration action on uh, uh, population fragmentation, determine the biologic gains of our action, and evaluate these gains over the long term. So it, it, it can apply for different scale and at the opposite of RFID, primarily to a quite a large scale like watershed or sub-basin scale. And it also allows to evaluate several dams simultaneously. So this is really interesting for the cost of your project. But the point is that you it, it requires fine investigation to collect the biological material. So when you work on rare species, it, it, it can be a, a, a problem. So two uh, examples, or maybe only one, I don't know if I, I have the time for two, we'll see. The first one is about the evaluation of the real effects of the fragmentation of the environments by dams on the genetic functioning of the brown trout population of Meche River. So this is a, a small river of uh, Massif Central in France. So here you have the hydrographic uh, map of Meche River with the all the, the, the dam in the river and the, in the tributary. What's the context of the project? The, pro the context is the, uh, the, the, the uh, defragmentation on the Wall River uh, in relation with the Water Framework Directive. And the, the local uh, manager wants to uh, prior his uh, action and his intervention on all these uh, dams. So first, they evaluate the, the passability of each dams, and the result was these maps that you can see, where we identify two dams, particularly imparti impacting for fish. So this is the two uh, two two point two black point that you can see, and really upstream. So on the left side of the map, you have a natural obstacle. And the objective of our study was to measure the impact of dam on gen flow, but also make an initial assessment before action on dams. So methodology. River uh, basin was divided into seven sections. So this is the yellow point that you can see in the map. And we sampled 22 to 51 trout per station. And we genotyping of, we did the, the genotyping of each individual uh, with the, at the level of uh, 14 micro satellites. So here is the results in the map. So the, that you have to, uh, how to read this map. So that's what we call cluster map. And on this small color graph, each bar corresponds to a trout. And more color you have in each bar, more genetic diversity you have. So many colors, uh, good genetic diversity, uh, just a few colors as like isolation uh, structure. So what you can see, globally, we have an homogeneous distribution of gel type within of the six most downstream station. And we have a brutal change uh, to the right uh, of the natural fall. 
So we have a highly isolated population upstream, upstream with no gen flow downstream, but we have also an, an intermediate population, so this is Meshe 6, with influences from both the isolated upstream population and the downstream population. So we have no genetic structuring due to the presence of the dams, of the two theoretically impacting dams. And we proved that we have a significant gen flow between the, the station. So the, the, what is interesting with this study is that we uh, highlight that fish connectivity here was not what, what was not the, the biggest problem for our uh, brown trout population. Probably uh, it, it's better to work on other parameters like habitat or term or temperature and things like this. But yeah, uh, dam, uh, it's actually not a problem here for gen flow. And the second example is a bit the same uh, uh, context, but with many dams and the multi-year intervention programs between 2008 and 2014. And the, the local manager asked us, uh, can we evaluate the effectiveness of our action? But without have to work dam by dam because there is too many dam to, to, to evaluate. So that's why we propose to use the genetic markers. And in some case, we, we can uh, um, achieving an uh, initial assessment to do a before after approach. So here is the river basin. Uh, so we have station sampled only after action, sampled, uh, station sampled only uh, after the, the action and station sampled before and after uh, the, the, the action. So we have six, 16 sites and we analyzed 100, almost 200 uh, trials, uh, still with uh, 14 microsatellite marker. So the result is, is the same uh, that the, you, you've seen before. So this is the distribution of genotypes on the nine sites sampled before action. So we identify, for example, here, site one and site five with clearly a poorly diversified population. So it suffers from geographical isolation. We also have a tendency to isolation on tributary, so the station number 14 and 16, with no movement of trout from this station to the other location uh, downstream of the river. And we have maintenance of uh, genetic diversity uh, on the, the station sites on the station four to nine, just uh, uh, thanks to downstream migration. And now result after action. And what we can see is first that we have significant good results on the, on the principal, on the main channel and on the tributary. The, the site number five and the site number eight. So we have significant movements of trout thanks to the, 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 the fish way and the, the dam removals. But we also still have several sites show sign of isolation. And if we look on the special case of sites two and three, 
it's interesting because just downstream of these two sites, there is a, a fish passage uh, built uh, recently. So this result show us that we have probably a problem of efficiency on this uh, uh, new fishway, and it's important to understand why and to uh, to manage it. Okay, so uh, thanks to this uh, uh, genetic study, we uh, highlight the 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 good results of the of the action in some place, but we also identify still isolated population, and it's important point for the the the, the river manager because he can. Uh, Identify the 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 and priorized is a uh, future action on dams. Okay, so I finished to present uh, this different tool, and I'm going to the conclusion now. So during this uh, presentation, we've seen why fish connectivity is important for all species of fish and we also uh, uh, talk about needs are expressed differently uh, at different scales of time and space. Uh, this is really important to get robust data on your river and your fish if you want to program and to perform effective actions. Actually, any action aimed at restoring fish continuity should ideally include a diagnostic prior to intervention and an ex post uh, evaluation. We've seen also that we have a wide range of tools at our uh, disposal and we've seen the, the importance to ask before which tool we need for which information uh, we need and uh, the last point of my presentation is this uh, table this synthesis table so I I, I don't want to uh, to to describe it. It just for you to to keep in mind. But you have the big objectives like migration flows, efficiency, passability of fishway, gen flow, and which tool correspond to to that objective, and with their advantages and their disadvantages. Okay. It's finished for me, so thank for your attention. I think I'm a bit late, but yeah, I'm uh, okay to answer to your question. Thank you, Jan, and uh, thank you for this uh, very clear explanation about the different tools. And it was uh, very interesting okay. to, uh, to, to hear about some of the example tools uh, and I'm happy that you explained some examples of the projects that you did. Um, I would like to ask the participants if you have any questions, please type your question in the chat window, which you see on your right. Um, and then Jan will be able to respond to them. Um, in the meantime, Jan, I was wondering, you showed us at the beginning a map of France with all the dams that are and obstacles that we have there. Um, and you said there are many tools to to evaluate this connectivity. Um, yep. So compared to the scale of the dams and the obstacles, um, are is the monitoring of the connectivity also applied at large scale in France? Uh, um, how can I spell that? Um, Maybe can you can you tell me again the, the, your question, please? There are many dams in France, 
Um, so yep. I'm wondering if there's also a lot of monitoring at all these dams and obstacles, or yeah, yeah. the monitoring okay. is still very little across the country. No, no, we, we have a big um, we we have a big national program uh, on uh, um, continuity restoration, uh, and there is a very very interesting objective of restoration. Uh, I I I don't have in my mind the the, the number of uh, dams to to restore, mm. but it's. Uh, uh, it's a lot, and it's also a really big job to manage yeah. because it's gonna take, uh, I think, many years to 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 do it. Uh, especially because uh, locally we have some uh, conflicts. I don't know if it's the right uh, word in English, but mm -hmm. we have local conflicts with. Uh, Especially with uh, with uh, owner of uh, dams, because they they want to keep uh, hydroelectric production or they want to keep the the, the patrimonial uh, character of their uh, dam. And so yeah, in France uh, there is this uh, conflict between uh, uh, an ambitious program, but also different, uh, yeah, different person or different organization who, who are not agree with this program. Yeah. They have a different interest, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And that the, the most, uh, the, the, the most, uh, Conflicted uh, organization is the I don't know the the, the word in English uh, the I, I will I will find the word just let me assume mm -hmm. this is uh, uh, meals. Order? Yeah, yeah, Mills. Yeah, yeah they they are organized uh, well, well organized in France, and they they yeah they they are quite uh, against the the project of uh, restoring continuity in France. Mm -hmm. I have what, a what we can... from um, from, from uh, Bruno. He asks. Um, he says, well, thanks, Jan, for the interesting presentation. And he's asking, is it mandatory in France to monitor if new fish passes are effective? <laughs> it's a really good question. Uh, because so we have a, a regulation uh, who obliged to equip dams with a fish passage. And we have an obligation of results, but this is not really clear what mean results. So uh, finally, uh, we w when the the owner uh, of a dam uh, build a, a fish passage, he, he don't know what to do to prove. If uh, his uh, fish passage uh, give the the good result or not, there, there is no uh, um, like a, a national uh, protocol or something like this. Uh, so yeah, th this is this is a bit of a problem because we have uh, during this time many 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 fish passage built in France. But there is a few studies about uh, evaluate their efficiency, mm -hmm. and um, what what we what we see in the field is that quite often uh, 
you need to to uh, come back after the the construction of your fish passage to uh, to arrange some part of the the, the fish passage. Sometimes is 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 this is about the attractivity. Sometimes this is about uh, the 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 pool or thing like this. But there is often uh, need to to uh, to to keep care of the the fish passage after the construction mm -hmm. to uh, ensure the their efficiency. But the maintenance yeah, this of is, the fish. This is not, yeah. yeah, this is not obligatory for for the, the the owner for the dam owner. So that's why it's there is only a few experiences. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know if I'm clear enough. Yes. So there's another question. Does telemetry allow quantitative analysis? Uh, yes, it's possible, uh, especially with passive telemetry, because we can tag a lot of fish. And also because it's weakly invasive. And so we can do some um, 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 mark, um, I don't know how to say in, uh, in English, in French, we call we call that capture and recapture. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's clear. Mm -hmm. So it means we, in a in a population, we tag uh, a number of fish that we released in the middle, and uh, later we do another, uh, uh, for example, another electronic uh, fishing, and we we tagged against some new fish and we find uh, how many was already tagged from the last uh, tagged session. Mm -hmm. And when you, when you do this uh, many times, there is a, a analysis uh, statistic method to go uh, into uh, quantitative approaches. But uh, mostly, this is for qu qualitative approaches and for uh, yeah individual uh, uh, pattern uh, uh, study. Yeah, yeah. So you, yeah. Thank you. That's clear. So the, um, um, the data that is collected is it. Uh, reported by the river basin authorities, for example, um, at regional or national scale? Uh, not yet, <laughs> because uh, I think it's it's maybe uh, too recent, mm -hmm. but it's I think it starts to to be. We're, we're much more organized in the in the future. We have a a, a national uh, uh, structure in France who uh, who have to manage the all the the national data about water in in general, mm -hmm. and they think about. Uh, um, Building a national database on uh, fish tag the data, yeah, and it yeah it can be really interesting, especially for uh, RFID, because you you have uh, more and more people and structure who tag fish in rivers, mm -hmm. and because mm -hmm. fish move a lot in rivers yeah it can be interesting to have a national base to yeah yes as a basis for policy actions or uh, actions on dams like you said yeah yeah exactly exactly and to compare the effectiveness yeah 
that's right. I'm checking if there's more questions, but at the moment I don't see any any other questions. So um, I would I would like to say uh, thank you again for your presentation, um, and to the participants, this webinar will upload be uploaded to Europe.wetlands.org, where you can find the link uh, very soon. So please, if you want to have a look back at the slides or hear the presentation again, uh, please visit our website later and you can find it there. Um, Jan, thank you very much. And, uh, thank you too. Yes. And there will be one last seminar um, in this series. Um, the date will be announced soon. It's about the construction and design of uh, fish passes, so very related to this topic. Um, it yeah. will be in February, and soon I will uh, I will publish the the exact date on the website, also Europe.wetlands.org. So I would like to invite all the participants to also um, visit our and participate in our final webinar on this topic. Um, and thank you for being here today. Thank you, Jan, as well. <laughs> Goodbye. Okay. Good afternoon. Goodbye. <laughs>